Alan Todd. I recently spoke to a young artist in Adelaide about the work she was doing. These were all easel paintings, none particularly large, and the subject matter was farm animals in fields. Now they were very well painted, but when I asked her what they were actually about, she was more concerned with the effect that they might have on people and how she might change the opinions of people about the world we live in and particularly that of the fate of animals. Well, she was adamant that painting had that power. Art history tells us that I don't think painting has that power at all and maybe never did have. If we're looking for the power of art to do anything, you've got to go back to, for instance, a Gothic cathedral. Now, it's not easel painting, but a building such as a Gothic cathedral was designed to add a note of awe to proceedings. So anybody entering and seeing the splendour of the interior would automatically be transformed into a willing servant of God. That is an example of power in architecture, and architecture itself is a powerful medium. Some of the brute architecture now all over the world gives us large, bare concrete blocks. That sort of idea was used particularly by someone like Mussolini to create government buildings that were faceless, powerful, large and block-like. The idea was probably the same sort of thing. You can inspire not just awe, but fear by giving people less rather than more. You don't decorate the building, you don't decorate the inside, and people will be in some way fearful. And that is the power of architecture. When Picasso painted Guernica, it was in response to the bombing of the unfortunate Spanish town and was in itself highly symbolic. For years it hung in the United Nations building in New York as a reminder of the inhumanity of humankind. But did it have any effect politically or essentially change attitudes? That's open to question. Painted in the Cubist style with references to Spanish culture and history, it was a record of outrage, which quickly passed into history as a tourist draw card. There is no doubt it's a great painting and from its time, it says a great deal about Picasso's attitude in particular. It struck a chord, but it's now just a museum piece. Well, we do have fabric. Now you may think, fabric, what's that got to do with power? Well, it depends what you do with it. If you convert it into a flag or a uniform, you've got a powerful symbol which people will follow. Now, we know this. We just watched on TV a whole lot of Trump supporters storm the Capitol in Washington, waving flags. Not just the American flag, but the Confederate one as well. They felt empowered through waving flags in such a way that they felt they could violate the seat of government with impunity. Well, they're probably going to find out they can't. But uniforms do the same thing. Every country uses uniforms as a symbol of power, and certainly members of armies throughout the world have believed in just such power. Put the uniform on, it's a powerful symbol. Other kinds of fabric? Probably not. No, I don't think batik is going to do that, or the curtains hanging in your house. So this is a very specific example. What else have we got? Well, it's very possible that you can have a painting that in some way creates public feeling. Now, I want to go back to just one example. In 1973, the then Prime Minister of Australia, Gough Whitlam, had James Mollison, the director of the National Gallery in Canberra, buy Blue Poles. This was a seminal Pollock work and there is no doubt of its power as a piece of work and as a piece of history. When it was purchased, it cost 1.3 million. In those days, it was absolutely unheard of to pay that sort of money for a work of art. And Australian works of art, even now, don't command those sorts of sums. So you can imagine the furor in the press in particular, and a whole load of critics, 
saying, oh, why are we buying this? It's all a load of rubbish anyway. For the best part of a year, the press devoted endless column inches, talk programs and talk back programs, debated the value of a Pollock painting, and it was endlessly reproduced. At the end of the year, though, it had ceased to have that function. People had grown tired of it. And today, it doesn't even rate a mention as a controversial anything. There are probably other things that have taken its place. But for a time, it had the power to create public opinion, to create camps within the community, those that hated it, those that didn't, and it had some degree of power as a piece of work to alter people's opinions. But that is in many ways unusual. There are other examples of art creating controversy, but did the art itself change the opinion or was it the fact that it even existed? I don't think that a Pollock with all the drips and splashes had the power to do anything of the kind. Even image-based work probably doesn't either. So what are we talking about here?